Welcome to Chapter 12. This is going to be the uh, first coverage of the immune system. So in Chapter 11, we learned a lot about the, uh, the small subset of microorganisms out there on the, in the world that are pathogenic, that <clears throat> invade the body and cause disease. And so we talked about how they accomplish that in, in Chapter 11 and how many of them have weapons that they use against us to help them establish themselves so that they can multiply and, and cause damage to the body. So now we're going to move and take a look at things from our side. What is the immune system? How do we fight off these infectious diseases? And then how do we develop what's called immunity, where you know when you get exposed to something, you're able to fight it off before that organism can even make you sick. So we'll be covering this here to wrap up the, uh, the course. And this uh, topic is divided up over three chapters. Uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13 will focus in on the, the basics of the immune system and how it works. It's a you know, miraculous body system. Um, it can be pretty complex though, so you want to make sure you're taking really good notes and trying to kind of follow along with things as a story. And uh, it'll make it easier for you to um, understand. Then we get into chapter 14. I'm going to be abbreviating the content that we cover with chapter 14 since we're kind of in a time crunch always here at the end of the course. But we'll talk about um, when things go wrong with the immune system. So we'll take a look at some things like allergies and immunodeficiencies and autoimmune diseases uh, as kind of a wrap up to this particular topic. All right, so let's get started. Um, so for our first video lecture here for chapter 12, we're going to kind of have a little bit of an overview of the immune system. So the host defenses, this is another term referring to your immune system. And as you guys will see as we go through the next couple of chapters, uh, immunity is divided up, which means that you are capable of fighting off a microorganism before it's able to make you sick, before it can start damaging you and you realize that you're ill. So this can be divided up into two broad categories. We have innate immunity. So this is immunity against microorganisms that you're born with. So right out of the gate, you have the ability to fight off many microorganisms. So think about it. You're constantly being bombarded by microorganisms all day long, but yet you hardly ever get sick if you have a normal functioning immune system. And so because of that, that's largely because of your innate immunity that you have to the vast, vast, vast majority of microorganisms that you encounter on a daily basis. So that's immunity that you're born with. Then acquired immunity. Now this is really the more complex part of the immune system and we'll cover that when we get into chapter 13. This is acquired um, or specific immunity where you don't have this branch of immunity to a particular microorganism until you get exposed to it. So when you think about, okay, so you get chicken pox as a kid and um, but then you don't get it again after that. And that's because you have acquired immunity to the chickenpox virus after being exposed to it. And that gets into a more elaborate system of cellular weapons and antibodies and so forth that's responsible for that type of immunity. So we'll get into that more in chapter 13. Another way to look at this is nonspecific versus specific immunity. So nonspecific means that we have um, features of the immune system and we have weapons of the immune system that are not directed to any specific microbial species or strain. It, there are things that either block microorganisms from getting into the body in general, or as soon as they do enter the body, you have an arsenal of cells and, and protein weapons that can attack the majority of microorganisms immediately. But those weapons are not directed to any specific species or strain of of microbe. On the other hand, specific immunity, and this gets into the acquired branch, or sometimes called adaptive immunity when we get into chapter 13. This is where you develop uh, cell weapons and antibody weapons that target a very specific microorganism, some particular species or strain. It gets down to the strain level. So you'll develop weapons against a particular strain of flu, for example, that may not necessarily work for the next strain of flu the following year, or like we were talking about with chicken pox, when you get exposed to chicken pox and have chicken pox disease, 
you develop a very specific set of cell weapons and antibody weapons that will attack that chicken pox virus if you ever get exposed to it again. So, and again, we'll get it more into specific immunity when we get into chapter 13. And we'll also, we're going to talk quite a bit about three levels of defense associated with the immune system. Your first line of defense consists of barriers, so things that prevent microbes from getting into the body in the first place. So think skin, think mucous membranes, and then we will uh, discuss some of the features at those locations. Um, very often microorganisms do get past the first line, and so then they meet up with the second lines of defense. So these are cells and also some chemical weapons, mostly proteins, that immediately act. So you don't have to have any prior exposure. These are just things that are available right away to attack bacteria and fungi and viruses and parasitic worms and protozoans right out of the gate immediately without any kind of previous exposure. And finally, you have the third line of defense, and this is acquired after exposure. Uh, the lymphocytes are the white blood cell warriors of this branch of your immune system, and you wind up with these very powerful, very specific responses to these foreign things that, have, that your body has been exposed to. All right, this is a pretty good little diagram in Chapter 12, and this is a good thing to come back to after you've been through chapters 12 and 13, just to kind of give you a broad overview of the three lines of defense, first, second, and third, and then the features that we discussed that are associated with all three of those lines. So chapter 12 is going to involve all of this right here. So chapter 12 will involve the innate, nonspecific immune system, and we'll talk about your first lines of defense and your second lines of defense, so you can see some of the features associated with these here, uh, with your second lines of defense, many of the things that we'll discuss are processes like phagocytosis and inflammation and fever. And then over here, this is going to be chapter 13, acquired specific immunity, sometimes called adaptive immunity. This is your third line of defense. And, um, and as we'll see, we'll mostly be talking about B cells and T cells and how they work and how they specifically target particular microorganisms. And we'll talk about things like antibodies as well when we get into chapter 13. All right, so now that we're finished with that little intro and overview of the immune system, let's move into the first lines of defense. Now, really, we talked about this uh, in chapter 11 because pathogenic microorganisms, you know, unless they're going to cause a skin infection or an infection directly on an, a mucous membrane, uh, they have to have some way of invading the body, getting past these barriers. So here's your barriers right here. Barriers consist of the skin and the mucous membranes, and you can go back to chapter 11 and review um, what we talked about in terms of their features. You know, they're epithelial tissues, cells are tightly packed together, so it's difficult for microorganisms to get past those barriers unless you've had some kind of a break. And we also talked about how some microbes have the ability to break apart those cell-cell connections or even kill the cells along the, the barrier linings, which allows them to invade deeper into the body, but most microbes can't do that. So most microbes never get into the body in the first place, never get into deeper tissues where they can cause an infection because they're blocked by the features of the skin and the mucous membranes. Now one feature that your skin and mucous membranes have is called desquamation, which is a fancy term for the sloughing off of the dead cells. So when you guys take AMP1 and you study the skin, you learn about how the, the oldest layers, the uppermost layers of the epidermis are constantly flaking off. So that's desquamation, because if you remember, your skin is composed of uh, stratified squamous epithelial cells. And then many of your mucous membrane linings also uh, are composed of multiple layers of squamous epithelial cells, and you also slough off those linings as well. So if you have microorganisms on those surfaces, they're going to get sloughed off with those dead cells. So that's, that's one feature of the barriers that helps keep microorganism populations under control. Uh, we talked about in chapter 11 how your mucous membranes, they don't have that keratin barrier. Remember your skin has that keratin protein, that kind of waxy, and it's also combined with some glycolipids there on the surface, which gives you a nice waterproof tight barrier at the surface of the skin. And your uh, mucous membranes, they don't have keratin, because those aren't dry surfaces, but they do have mucus 
that helps trap dust and, and microorganisms and so forth that wind up landing, other particles that wind up landing, landing along those membranes and, then or, and or you've got other fluids that wind up flushing those mucosal membrane surfaces, like think about your urine flow coming out of the urethra, for example. Another big time feature of the barriers, those commensal and mutualistic microorganisms that we've talked about. Uh, they outcompete pathogens, they take up space, uh, they use up nutrients and so forth, and so by doing that they're, they're reducing the, the uh, likelihood that a pathogen can come in and, and uh, invade and, and get established. And then we're also beginning to understand more and more that, that these commensal and mutualistic microorganisms that live on and inside your body um, are able to train your host defenses. So this isn't completely well understood yet, but your host defenses have to learn how to keep these commensal and mutualistic populations in check without completely wiping them out, because that wouldn't be good for you. If your immune system swarmed in and wiped out your normal microbiota, uh, you would lose those benefits of the normal microbiota. But then we also need the immune system to still attack and kill pathogens when they invade these locations in the body. So how all that works is still not all that well understood, but it's a pretty amazing thing that our immune system has been trained to be able to do that. All right, so back in chapter 11, just as a review, um, another barrier feature, the ciliated lining of the respiratory tract. So down here in your trachea, that inner lining is a pseudostratified ciliated epithelial tissue lining. And uh, also up here in your nasal cavity, you have a ciliated lining as well. And if you guys remember the cilia, trap mucus, trap microorganisms, trap dust particles. You've also got mucus there as well participating in all of this. And then the cilia down in here will sweep upward. So you sweep the microorganisms upward. In the nasal cavity you sweep backwards. And of course the idea here is you sweep these things over here to the back of your throat into the pharynx and then you either cough them out or you swallow them down your esophagus and they go careening down into your stomach acid and stomach acid pH is so low that's going to kill most microorganisms that land there. So the ciliated lining is an important barrier feature for parts of the respiratory tract. Now one thing we did not talk about in chapter 11, you have some special cells that live along your barriers, skin and mucous membranes, and they're called dendritic cells. So dendritic, maybe that's reminding you of something from Biology 201 when you study the nervous system. Remember the, the dendrites, the long extensions that come off of the cell body of neurons. So dendritic cells are not neurons, but uh, here's what one looks like under the heavily magnified under the microscope. And so they've got a main cell body here and then lots of these little long arm-like extensions or leg-like extensions that, that come off of the cell body. So they kind of have a spidery appearance. And again, they're not neurons, they just kind of look like neurons. And so these cells are hanging out, so this is a, a diagram of the epidermis of the skin. And so you have these dendritic cells hanging out in your skin, you've also got them in your mucous membranes. And with these long extensions, when you have microorganisms that are trying to penetrate through the barrier, many of them are going to wind up sticking to these long extensions. And then these cells do phagocytosis, so they'll engulf those microorganisms and then bring them inside the cell and, and destroy them. So those dendritic cells are helping to play a role at the barriers with controlling the numbers of microorganisms that are able to get through here and wind up down here deeper in the body where they're not supposed to be. When we get to chapter 13, we're also going to see that these dendritic cells are really, really important for stimulating or activating lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the white blood cell warriors of the third line of defense and so we'll see how all of that works when we get into chapter 13. So along your barriers you have some chemical defenses. Many of these are proteins, uh, not all of them, so you do have some acidic compounds in your sweat, your stomach secretions, which we've already talked about, also along the vaginal lining. And actually the ones along the vaginal lining are made by commensal or mutualistic bacteria that live there. They do fermentation, 
Remember when fermentation takes place, many bacteria make acids from that. Those acids get released along the inside lining of the vagina and that helps lower the pH there and it prevents many pathogens from being able to grow. Same, same thing on your skin. When you sweat out acids onto the surface of your skin, it lowers the pH along the surface. and um, So your normal microbes that live on the skin are adapted to that, but a lot of pathogens that might cause skin infections aren't very well adapted to that slightly lower pH along the skin, so they don't grow very well. Uh, lysozyme, so this is something that's very important. This is a protein enzyme and uh, it's present in a number of our secretions, so it's present in sweat and tears and saliva. And this is an enzyme that digests peptidoglycan. So where have we heard of peptidoglycan before? Hopefully you're thinking about bacterial cell walls. Hopefully you're thinking that we've talked about over and over again this semester that this is not a human compound. This is a bacterial compound. So it's good for us that we have this enzyme in a lot of our secretions along our barriers that will specifically digest bacterial cell walls. So this is a, a diagram over here. If you guys remember, peptidoglycan consists of a bunch of sugar strips, repeating units of a sugar called NAG and another one called NAM. And what this enzyme does is it breaks the connections between those NAG-NAM uh, sugars. So it breaks apart the, the bacterial cell wall. And if you guys remember, when that happens, that bacterial cell is much more likely to blow up or lice due to osmosis when, as the cell takes up water. And this is not the same thing as a lysosome. So we've talked about lysosomes um, as playing a role during phagocytosis, and we'll hear about those again later. This is a, uh, that's an organelle inside cells, sometimes thought of as the stomach of eukaryotic cell, or animal cells. And um, lysozyme is a particular protein enzyme that has a very specific job that it does. We also have some proteins called uh, defensins that are um, produced by various cell types. These are present along the barriers. And what these do, these are good at attaching to microbial membranes, uh, bacteria, yeast, and so forth, and some viruses. And when they do that, they create pores, and that winds up their hole. Remember I talked about how there's a lot of hole punching that goes on in this battle between us and the microbes, and so here's an example of some human proteins called defensins that attach to microbial membranes and, and poke holes in their, in their membranes. Lots of hole punching going on in this, in this battle. There are also some that are called dermicidins that are more specific to the skin. There's a lot of research into this area. Um, these are somewhat newly discovered and um, so there are some researchers who are trying to figure out well can we artificially make these defensins since they're pretty good at attaching to microbial cell membranes and poking holes in them and could, could we use these? Could we harness these defensins and make them you know in larger amounts and maybe use those as a new type of antimicrobial drug? All right so that was just kind of a quick overview of the barriers. You know, Be sure you're doing your reading as well because you'll pick up on a few more details about the barriers in your reading. The next uh, video lecture, we're first going to have a, another a little bit broader overview about the second and third lines of defense. Um, and then after that, we're going to wind up talking about various processes of the second lines of defense as we continue here through through chapter 12. Remember again, with chapter 12, we're, we're focusing in on innate immunity. So immunity to microorganisms that you are born with and this innate immunity is non-specific. It's not targeting any particular strain or species of microorganism.